and welcome to this recorded presentation from the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. This presentation, consisting of three short talks about the legacy of slavery and contemporary museum practice, was recorded in the spring of 2021 as part of our programming for the gallery's summer exhibition, Rembrandt in Amsterdam. My name is Erica Dolphin. I am the interim senior curator of prints and drawings at the gallery and the organizing curator for Rembrandt in Amsterdam, for the Rembrandt in Amsterdam exhibition. Today, you will hear from three scholars from the Netherlands, followed by a conversation with all of us at the end. Note that for viewers who like to read along as they listen, closed captioning is available by clicking on the button, the CC button, closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. Now, I'd like to take a moment to express my gratitude and acknowledge that the National Gallery is located on the traditional, unceded, and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. I am grateful to the many stewards of this land and traditions in the past and in the present who have safeguarded and continue to share a wealth of different knowledges that are widening my own perspective and the direction of my own work as a historian. The exhibition Rembrandt in Amsterdam was conceived by Stephanie Dickey, Bader Chair in Northern Baroque Art at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario, and she is the guest curator for the National Gallery of Canada. The exhibition is co-organized with Jochen Sander, Vice Director of the Stedel Museum in Frankfurt, Germany. The original conception of the exhibition, focusing on Rembrandt and his career, along with that of his colleagues, in the booming port of Amsterdam during the first decades of the 1600s, made perfect sense in the National Gallery of Canada's long tradition of producing exhibitions of European artists who excelled in their domains. But in the 21st century, it's clear that there is much more to say and discover. We've always known that the tremendous wealth that paid for the great flourishing of the art market, what made Rembrandt's career possible in, the 17th, in 17th century Amsterdam, was due to the success of the Dutch mercantile economy, which was based on its growing stronghold of a vast network of global trade. But historians of Western art have only rarely paused to consider the human cost of the Dutch colonial project. Hundreds of thousands of peoples from West Africa were enslaved, torn from their homes and shipped across the ocean in unimaginably horrendous conditions to be sold if they survived to work on sugar, coffee and tobacco plantations and in other exploitative labor practices. Today's presentations provide an opportunity for our audience to hear from three scholars from the Netherlands to discuss the legacy of the Dutch role in the transatlantic trade transatlantic slavery and the significance of enacting socially and culturally, cultural, culturally inclusive strategies in museums for today and for the future. To start, I'd like to introduce Dr. Karwan Fata Black, a lecturer of social and economic history at the Institute of, for History of Leiden University. He has published on the history of early modern Atlantic trade, colonial government, slavery, and emancipation. His lecture traces the history of racialization and the Dutch role in transatlantic slavery, its abolition, and afterlives. Welcome, Dr. Karwan Fata Black. Uh, thank you um, for, the, for the introduction, for the land acknowledgement. And um, I, I will uh, start sharing my screen. So the, 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 the location where um, uh, Rembrandt uh, grows up, the place where Rembrandt grows up and, and, and built his career is of course um, uh, the, the, the Low Countries here depicted as this collection of uh, 17 provinces. And these uh, 17 pro provinces were in the late 16th, early 17th century in a process of uh, tremendous uh, transformation. On the one hand, in the 16th century, there, there was a clear development of urban economies and trade and a growing sense of um, uh, independence, maybe, in these, uh, in these urban societies. 
um, and this led in the late uh, late 16th century to a, a conflict uh, conflict with the king located in uh, in Spain and a conflict that played out as well more or less a civil war between the northern and, and southern parts of this uh, this lion that you see here these 17 provinces resulting in seven provinces taking their own uh, form forging their own alliance and, and becoming um, a collective um, a, 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 a republic and this uh, new republic um, was very averse to uh, slavery um, and I think that is an important point to 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 mention and to address so while the northern provinces the seven united provinces were fighting against uh, Spain they developed a, a story about their own national plight that um, uh, was uh, uh, very clearly opposed to the kind of tyranny that um, was part of the Spanish Empire. And in one of his, his addresses, William of Orange likens the Dutch to the indigenous in the Americas as suffering under the Spanish yoke. And philosophers and political thinkers in the late 16th century, early 17th century also say, well, we, we should not participate in that kind of tyranny. We should not uh, conquer the lands overseas. We should not engage in that kind of, uh, in, in the kind of slavery that comes uh, with it. Um, and the reason for this was that, that in the cities of the, 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 the low countries, the urban low countries, uh, slavery had disappeared uh, and had been uh, gone for, for centuries. And slavery was still known as something that was outside of these areas, um, but um, cities prided themselves on the fact that there was no slavery there and that they were actually uh, free soil and, and, and places where enslaved people could flee to and they would not be extradited to their former owners. Even in some places, they would be declared free the moment they stepped on that, that, that free soil. So we see that in the low countries, there is an adversity to empire building and there is an adversity to, to slavery or, or even a sense of, of anti-slavery. And I think that gives you uh, a sense of how much changed in the period of, uh, of Rembrandt. In Rembrandt's time, um, this all, uh, these ideas uh, changed and the Dutch became a very formidable global empire that employed slavery on, uh, on an incredible uh, scale. So what happens? Um, well, the Dutch uh, uh, split in this very painful war with, uh, with Spain between this northern and southern half, um, and Antwerp, which had been a place that was for a long time uh, an important node in global trade, from where uh, goods from Asia, from the Americas, had, uh, and from Africa, had come to Northwestern Europe and were re redistributed. Uh, but in this war, in this, this war between the North and, uh, and Spain and the South, um, uh, Antwerp is uh, sacked. And the people who were part of this global trading network, they, uh, they leave Antwerp and they flee to the Northern cities. And these Northern cities were not very impressive on their own. Um, uh, places like Amsterdam, uh, Middelburg, uh, Leiden were still quite small, but these uh, new immigrants bring with them the knowledge about this, this, the possibilities of, of global trade, and they also bring with them uh, a bitterness about the war and a feeling that a, a revenge has to be um, uh, undertaken against, against Spain. Um, and what we see is that these uh, immigrants from the south will become the driving force behind the idea that the Dutch should begin to engage in, uh, uh, in empire building and, in, uh, uh, and also in, uh, in, in, in slavery. Um, this is a somewhat protracted uh, process because the, the Dutch are not in a very good position in the early uh, 17th century. The war is not uh, uh, going so well for them. They conclude a truce for 12 years. Um, and at the end of those 12 years, 
the decision is made that they will find the Dutch West India Company, the Dutch West India Company is founded 400 years ago this year, um, and this is going to be a war-making institution that is going to uh, assault the Spanish Empire where it can uh, really do damage, for example, by, uh, by attacking um, uh, colonies in the, uh, in the Americas. Um, those first assaults are very spectacular. Um, uh, they capture the Dutch West India Company, captures um, the, um, uh, the port of Bahia. Uh, they capture a, 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 a tremendous amount of silver from the, uh, from the Spanish uh, galleons. Um, and they start to develop what will be known as the grand design. Um, and they build towards what is now uh, uh, coined uh, by, by Wim Closer as the Dutch moment in Atlantic history. Uh, from the 1730s, uh, the 1630s to the 1650s, uh, the Dutch are able to, um, uh, or the West India Company is able to grab uh, parts of, uh, of, uh, of Brazil and from Brazil begin building a colonial empire, capturing uh, fortresses on the African coast and um, uh, uh, some uh, some other islands and areas in the um, uh, in the Caribbean, as well as um, uh, uh, New Amsterdam and uh, New Netherland in uh, North America. And um, when doing this, uh, this has been a debate within Dutch society: should we engage with this or not? And the ones who argue that they uh, that that the Dutch should uh, win this uh, win this debate. Uh, and the result is that they will uh, become part of this transatlantic slave trade that had been set up uh, under under Portuguese um, uh, under Portuguese rule in the in the century before, and that means that they um, have to justify uh, what they are doing, and that they have to to justify um, uh, enslavement of uh, of people even if the Dutch themselves keep slavery outside of their own territories and continue to say that slavery is, is, an, is, is, a, is a bad form of, um, of, of uh, service and, and subjection and, and should, be, uh, should be avoided. So from this paradox of on the one hand realizing um, how bad slavery is and on the other hand uh, seeing the need for it in, in, in building their empire, um, uh, you see the development of this, this racial slavery in the, um, um, uh, in the period of uh, the 1630s and 1650s with the colony of Dutch Brazil, with an important role for um, uh, Johan Maurits van Nassau Siegen, who is the, uh, a part of the Nassau family and tries to do, build his career as a prince overseas. And, and, and really sees the need for, uh, for, for, slave, uh, for slave trade um, and enslavement and everything that comes uh, with it. Uh, and that includes um, uh, uh, new forms of, of racialization and new ideas about, about slavery and justification for slavery based on, uh, based on race. And I think in the work of, in the artistic production of that time, you can very well see that kind of uh, contradiction that is, uh, that is going on in this period. On the right, um, uh, you see a drawing from uh, Dutch Brazil. Uh, I think a very important drawing because it's um, uh, uh, one of the few that we have of enslaved people in um, in the uh, in, in the colony of Dutch uh, Dutch Brazil, but also because it's so um, uh, clearly uh, visible uh, that this is uh, this is a form of enslavement that was unknown uh, in in the Netherlands in the in, in the in the centuries before. And the woman that's displayed here has the initials of uh, Johan Maurits van Nassau Siegen uh, branded on her chest. Uh, at the same time, in the same moment, we see the kind of drawings and paintings that, uh, that, that Rembrandt did of the people who, uh, because of these uh, connections of trade, of shipping, of uh, military service, people from uh, the African continent, from Brazil, um, arrive in Amsterdam. They are there. They are there not in a position of servitude and slavery, but you can clearly see that, 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 that there is a, um, a 
a recognition of common humanity in the way that Rembrandt paints, um, uh, for example, these two men who most likely lived in the in the street where he uh, where he worked. So there is a lot of contradiction, of course, in in this in this colonial engagement. Uh, in in uh, on the one hand pro proximity, and on the other hand, the dehumanization and and subjection that comes with uh, with racialized slavery. Um, the Dutch don't hold on to their empire. So first they're hesitant to become an empire, then they, they really build this empire for, for a period of 25, 20 years, but they're unable to really sustain it and they lose uh, uh, Dutch Brazil, they lose control over Brazil. Um, and the Dutch West India Company then shifts its uh, strategy. Um, what they had learned in uh, Brazil about slave trading is not abandoned when they lose control over the territory in Brazil, uh, but they, they continue it and they begin surfacing other empires um, uh, in, uh, in, in, in this uh, uh, traffic of, uh, of human, uh, human beings. Um, and what you see here is maybe uh, familiar to, uh, uh, to some of you. This is sort of a, an, an overview of the history of transatlantic slavery and the numbers of people that were um, uh, forced across the Atlantic, deported across the Atlantic Ocean by different uh, nations. And you can see, well, the, 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 the letters might be a bit small, but you can see the green line is uh, Great Britain that in the 18th century becomes a ma major slave trading nation. And then you see the red, uh, the red line being uh, Portugal and Brazil. Um, uh, after the British abolition, they take on a, a massive role in slave trade. And because of these kind of figures of the 18th century, we don't see what actually happened in the 17th century. So this, the scale of the transatlantic slave trade in the 18th century distorts our understanding of what was going on in the 17th century. But if we look more closely at what we see in the graph for the 17th century, we see that after the fall of Brazil, so in the mid um, uh, uh, 1650s, the Dutch become the largest uh, slave trade in, in the Atlantic world and they, um, uh, they take over basically uh, the Portuguese role in this, uh, uh, in this uh, trade and um, uh, well half of, um, if, you, if you look closer at the numbers you see that half of the enslaved Africans shipped across the Atlantic in the third quarter of the 17th century go on board of um, uh, on board of Dutch uh, Dutch ships. So um, this this transition, the several transitions of the Dutch first as hesitant uh, colonialists, then as empire builders, then failing empire builders. Um, uh, but despite their failure, they will continue as um, uh, uh, as human traffickers, um, shipping people. Uh, well, first to Brazil, after Brazil fails, they will uh, 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 go to many other different colonies and especially to Curaçao. And in Curaçao, uh, people are brought there only temporarily and then uh, uh, deported onwards to uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish colonies. So the Dutch take that role as middlemen in the Atlantic uh, slave trade. Um, After that, after that, that failure and the turn towards slave trading, this cult uh, and this culture of black uh, submission and a white uh, superiority uh, continues and, and becomes even more pronounced and uh, 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 greater, especially under the rule uh, and the rise to power of stadtholder um, uh, uh, William III, William III, who was not only of course, stadtholder to the Netherlands, but also with, uh, uh, with Mary, uh, becomes William and Mary, um, a king of um, uh, uh, England, uh, Scotland and, uh, and Ireland. Um, and then, of course, at the head of a, of a, global, uh, of a global empire. And, and under him and in his court, you see really a sort of an, an, a new lease of life to that, that, that culture of, of black submission. Um, you see in the right-hand corner a, um, um, uh, a uh, painting that that he commissioned specifically. It's in the um, uh, in the Mauritz House, the National Gallery. It is a, a painting uh, of his deceased uh, mother, um, with um, her wearing Brazilian feathers 
and being escorted by a, a, a black servant. Um, other people here you see uh, uh, next to them, you know, there's another example, um, and, and there are many of these in this era of, uh, of William III, where uh, women and men are depicted with, um, uh, uh, with a, uh, a black child on their side to emphasize their um, natural uh, rule. They will never look at, the, at, that, at their servant, um, and the servant will always be assisting them without them having to supervise it. It emphasizes, of course, the difference in, uh, in, in, in skin color in these kind of images. And it's clear that that happens at the end of the, um, uh, of the 17th century much more than, than we saw it before. It has been a, a theme in, in art history, of course, for a long time, but there is a, there is a growth of this in, the, in this era of, of William III. You see a beautiful little etching of um, uh, William III studying at Leiden University, having two, um, uh, two servants at his, uh, at his side. Oh, I lost control of my PowerPoint. Um, all right, so uh, 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 slavery remains something that is um, uh, not allowed in uh, uh, the Netherlands, um, but you see that even that sacred principle of free soil is um, infringed upon because of uh, colonial slavery and the racialized logic that comes uh, with it. And here you see a, a, a law, a concept for a law that was passed in 1776, um, where the um, States General declares that this principle of free soil has been there for centuries, and it is a fantastic and important part of uh, uh, of the Netherlands, but that uh, the principle of free soil could not mean that we're going to infringe upon the, the, the rights and the freedom um, of our own people. And so if they bring with them enslaved people from the colony specifically, so um, uh, uh, black servants to the Netherlands, that they can uh, uh, be exempted from this uh, free, soil, uh, free soil rule. Um, so, being implicated in, um, in, 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 in this colonial project made the Dutch uh, 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 change their attitudes regarding race um, and also made um, uh, them even uh, change their attitudes uh, regarding slavery on their, own, uh, on their own soil. So, under... Um, pressure of the um, uh, abolition of uh, slavery in the British Empire. Um, the Dutch will be forced in the 19th century to abandon um, uh, slavery uh, and, and the slave trade. Um, this happens in uh, 1814. The Dutch are forced to formally end uh, their slave trading activities, but they really drag their feet at, uh, at complying um, and really not very much happens uh, and they continue not taking any serious measures I would say till the late uh, 1820s. So slavery and um, uh, 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 the slave trade ends under British pressure in, uh, in, in the early 19th century but then enslavement itself in the colonies really continues um, uh, uh, until 18, uh, 1863. Um, in 1860, uh, slavery is uh, abolished in the, uh, uh, in the Asian uh, part of the Dutch uh, uh, Empire, and in 1863, uh, 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 slavery is, uh, is, is abolished in the Atlantic colonies. But this abolition, um, like with the abolition of the slave trade, the abolition of slavery um, is something that comes very slowly and comes in a way that is um, uh, quite successfully controlled by uh, slave owners and those interested in the industries around slave ownership. Um, so what you see is that they are able to, to postpone uh, the decision for, for abolition um, and they're also able to dictate the compensation that they will get for um, a, a, a freeing enslaved people. Um, and until the last moment, uh, lobbyists continue to try to raise uh, the, 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 the amount of money they get in compensation for, 
um, uh, uh, losing uh, control over their uh, uh, over their slaves, um, and they also force one of the most um, uh, extensive uh, apprenticeship uh, apprenticeship systems in the uh, in the Atlantic world. They um, uh, uh, force through that all the enslaved field uh, workers are forced to sign contracts for 10 more years with slave owners. Um, and so to give them an extension ba basically of control over the, uh, over the field workers on the, uh, on the plantations. So you see very clearly that yes, abolition comes in the 19th century, um, but those who were slave owners are able to dictate many of the aspects of that uh, abolition. And abolition means an, an, a, a juridical formal end to slavery, but it really does not mean an end to um, a, a racialized hierarchies in the, uh, in the Dutch Empire. So what you see is um, a, 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 an end to formal slavery, but a continuation of um, a racial exclusion, and maybe also a sharpening of this kind of um, a, a, a racialized forms of, of hierarchy and exclusion and um, uh, attempts at, uh, uh, at civilizing missions in the, um, uh, in the colonies. So that means that um, the narrative that is told within the ne Netherlands about the history of slavery and about the history of racialization is dictated by the colonial state. And the colonial state is able to continue um, the, the narrative of slavery as one that had been beneficial to the enslaved and had also been um, uh, a, 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 a positive the ending of slavery, a positive contribution made by the uh, by the colonial uh, 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 by the colonial state itself, and against this, of course, there had always been a um, remembering of the reality of slavery, and um, of a uh, another side to that story that was less self-congratulatory for the Dutch, but that was a side of the story that was really unheard and remained unheard for, well, maybe to the present day. Uh, and it's only now that we see slowly, slowly, sort of a new narrative about this history developing um, and becoming more part of, of the mainstream. It had been there for, um, for, for uh, a century and a half, but it's, um, um, it has been pushed from the, uh, uh, from the mainstream for a very long time. And an important part of this uh, transition that, that, that we're seeing are um, movements that argue that for the commemoration of the uh, uh, abolition of slavery and the commemoration of the history of slavery itself. And um, these movements are very successfully now uh, beginning to change both the narrative about their own history, but also the, 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 the narrative of, um, uh, of the Netherlands about its implication in the history of slavery and its role in um, not solving the, the um, inequities that were at the basis, at, at the heart of the, of the slave system. So we see that this movement is um, uh, really opening, uh, opening ground to, to address this, uh, this history in a more open, uh, more open way and to confront the, the longer uh, legacies that it has left. Thank you, Carwin. That was a very rich and nuanced history of the Dutch colonial project um, and the impact of slavery. You have given us a lot of food for thought and I look forward to our discussion at the end. For the first time in the history of the Rijksmuseum, the internationally recognized museum is organizing an exhibition on slavery in the Dutch colonial period. I just heard the exciting news that the exhibition opened to school children this week and is slated to open to the general public very soon, we hope. The exhibition tells 10 true stories from people who were involved in slavery in one way or another through objects, paintings, archival materials such as poems and music, as well as oral histories. As head of history, Dr. Velika Smolders and her team created the groundbreaking exhibition, Slavery. Born in Curaçao, Velika obtained her doctorate at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam with a thesis on the presentation of the slavery past in Suriname, Curaçao, Ghana, and South Africa. 
In her work, she focus, focuses on heritage, the colonial past, social diversity, representation and new audiences, bridging divides between heritage institutions, universities and community organizations. Welcome, Dr. Velika Smulders. Thank you for the introduction and thank you so much for having me as part of this uh, interesting conversation. Um, well, as you uh, as said, Erica, the museum is still closed. We're still in the middle of a pandemic here. Um, so um, the exhibition for us has been something that we've been working on for a long time. It was originally planned to be opened uh, September last year. So we've had to delay it due to the pandemic. And now we've decided to uh, open it uh, anyway, because, uh, well, we can't uh, delay it anymore. So we were very happy that it would, um, that it was opened by the Dutch King last Tuesday. Uh, and it was all broadcasted on national television. So in that sense, we have been able to reach a lot of people, um, as this is an important exhibition that a lot of people have looked forward to. So we are very excited that even though the circumstances are very difficult, we have still been able uh, to do this. Um, it was an hour of live television during the opening, and then later on in the evening, there was another hour where public television um, showed all kinds of uh, extra information. Um, and that was followed by another hour of a um, film about the making of the exhibition. So we were so lucky to be able to uh, show so much of our work, even though the museum is still closed. So how did we get here? Because like Erica said, it is something that the Rijksmuseum has never done before, organizing an exhibition on slavery. And Andrea, maybe you could move on to our next slide. Because um, I would like to show you um, what our surroundings are, the building uh, in which the Rijksmuseum is uh, um, uh, Positioned. Um, the Rex Museum was built uh, at the end of the colonial era in 1885. So that means that uh, when the uh, building was done, um, it was the era in which Europe was just starting out uh, building its national museums, in which uh, what was showcased was a national narrative. Uh, and in the Dutch case, it was about a small seafaring nation that um, uh, sailed across the world, conquered all kinds of uh, faraway regions, uh, both to the east and to the west. And in that sense, it quickly grew out from a small nation um, to uh, a world power. So the narrative that, it's, that has been told in the National uh, Museum um, from the beginning was very much about the wealth and the success. Um, and that's a narrative that is very difficult to counter uh, with other uh, narratives. And it's very difficult as well to put other narratives um, parallel to that narrative. So the building was there to convey the stories of the rich and powerful. And the collection was also built on uh, the private collections of the rich and powerful. And the heart, at the heart of our collection is a uh, are the uh, 17th century paintings uh, by Dutch masters, um, which is what visitors come from across the world uh, to us to be able to see. And if we move on to the next slide, I want to take you inside the building to our gallery of honor. This is our central part of the uh, museum where most muse um, visitors, international visitors come to the museum for. Right at the end, you see our most powerful, most well-known painting, which is the Night Watch by Rembrandt. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, about him in a minute. But what I wanted to show you here is um, that it's all about this um, uh, old art, uh, art of the 17th century. 
And the question is, what are we showing here and what are we not showing? For a long time, this went unquestioned. It was, it, it was just there and it was uh, legitimized by an argument about aesthetics, that this was the top of the bill of art and uh, its connection to Dutch history. Um, but of course, you could be able to uh, choose uh, what you wanted to show um, with the narrative as a departure as well. So the museum is coming to terms with that. And we've recently decided that uh, representation should be more at the core of what we're showing. So since this past month, since the 8th of March, um, we've put up for the very first time since the beginning of the museum, three paintings done by female painters. Um, and those are Judith Leister, Gesina Ter Borg and uh, Rachel Ruis. Um, and that way the uh, Gallery of Honor transforms in a much more inclusive representation of what the Netherlands is and what, um, who its painters were. Now, if we look at the night watch at the end of the gallery um, done by Rembrandt, that's the central focus point of the whole gallery. Um, so you could ask uh, again the question, what are we representing here and what are we not taking into account? Um, it's a painting that's very much about uh, men, about militia who protected uh, Amsterdam. Um, and at first glance, you notice um, these are all white men. Um, it's people um, uh, or people take um, uh, this reality to be the reality of Amsterdam uh, uh, during the time. So if we, um, but there was another reality nonetheless. Um, we know that um, from the colonial period on, but also at the end of the uh, Middle Ages, there was a black presence in Amsterdam. There were African people living in Amsterdam. And uh, we know that there was a small community uh, of Africans living in um, Amsterdam near the Kloveniersburgwal, where uh, Rembrandt was living. So he was in touch with these people and um, uh, some of them were brought in as servants. Um, they were probably enslaved when they were brought in to the Netherlands. Um, but some of them also, since the Middle Ages, had been living here because they were brought here by uh, their work. They were diplomats, for example, or um, uh, seafarers. So they were also uh, free people of color living in the Netherlands. And if we go to our next slide, um, we'll zoom into uh, the night watch. Um, and I've put in, I've inserted uh, a painting that Carwan also just showed us, uh, also done by Rembrandt, but not in our Rex Museum collection. It's in the collection of the Maurits House, in which he portrays the people who were probably living near him. So Rembrandt was very much aware that there were uh, different realities at the same time in the Netherlands. Um, and I think uh, Carmen put it quite beautifully when he said, you can see in the way that Rembrandt depicted him, there's this recognition of a common humanity. He uh, did not paint these people, as you see in so many other paintings, as servants, as a symbol of a hierarchy between Europe and other parts of the world, between Europe and, and Africa. It is very much about uh, the first Afro-Dutch, really, um, who've been here um, since uh, that 17th century. And right next to our Rembrandt, so um, uh, one of the main paintings that all of the visitors to the Rijksmuseum see is a painting done by Bartholomeus van der Helst, which also shows that black presence in uh, 17th century, the Netherlands. Um, and in this case, it's a young African boy. If we move on to the next slide, I've integrated a, a video in there, and um, I wanted to show you this video first. 
This is the story of an African young man in 17th century Amsterdam in 60 seconds. Throughout history, people have traveled and migrated, also from Africa to Europe. But from the 17th century on, during colonial times, we see that the depiction of people of African descent in Dutch paintings changes. We see a lot of young African men depicted as servants. This young man, right in the middle of this Van der Hels painting, right next to our most famous painting, might have come to Amsterdam through the Bicker family, who had prominent positions in the West India Company. Slavery was not permitted at the time in the Netherlands, but the way this young man was depicted tells us a lot about the way that these early Afro-Dutch were treated. Archival records show us that these young men formed a life for themselves, marrying and starting families. What percentage of Dutch society carries their DNA, even without knowing it? Okay, so what we've just shown is that um, um, there was this presence here and there was uh, uh, people from African descent living here, marrying here, um, um, having children um, and the generations that uh, followed them. In some cases, the people um, uh, that are descendant of these first African Dutch do not realize that they are descendants of Africans themselves. So it shows, it just goes to show that uh, the Netherlands are much more diverse than we would think. Um, and there are different ways of relating to slavery. Um, people thinking that um, the color of your skin nowadays says something about uh, the, the, your ancestors and the position they had within the slavery system um, during colonial times, it is not so black and white. There's a lot of gray in between. And now in the slavery exhibition, we are talking about that. We are showing uh, a story of a young African boy who, um, um, which is a representation of what we've uh, just seen. And uh, we are very excited to be able to uh, bring that into the general discussion. Uh, the amount of African DNA that's carried on by uh, uh, Dutch people. So, um, this slide I have on right here, this is about the slavery exhibition. In 2017, uh, the Rijksmuseum announced that uh, it was going to put up its very first exhibition on slavery. Um, and the exhibition was scheduled for 2020. It's now going to uh, be on in this year which means that we have been working on it for three, four years. Um, and we've done this in a very transparent way. We knew that that would be really important to draw in uh, expertise, uh, to have that um, connection to what's happening in the public debate, to have the connection to the people who um, feel that this history is part of their personal history, it's their ancestor story that we are um, um, bringing into the museum. So we needed to bring um, uh, these people in as well. So it grew out to be this huge project in which uh, we did um, explicitly not work from an ivory tower in the um, museum, but we brought in expertise in all kinds of ways. We uh, organized a think tank, our Carmen Fata Black was part of that, Asfa Bijna was also, uh, and we had one-on-one -on -one connections to a lot of um, um, uh, researchers. Uh, we spoke to a lot of people with all kinds of backgrounds to really be in touch with what people wanted us to put up and what would be important to them. So we decided on making it a very personal exhibition. 
excuse me, because we thought it would be uh, really important to connect with a, a very broad audience. We know that our regular visitors are very much um, uh, Dutch citizens that do not feel a personal connection to this history. We want to bring in new audience with a Caribbean background um, that would be first time visitors. And we wanted uh, them to really trust us with uh, their story. Um, and we knew that we had to bring all those voices together um, because we have this um, uh, um, message as a national history of uh, the Netherlands to connect all those people together. So we wanted it to be really relatable. So one of the um, so we've decided to focus on ten personal stories, and they should be uh, stories of people who were enslaved, stories of people who were slave owners, and the counter voices as well. And one of the um, uh, one of the famous paintings that we focused on uh, right away that we wanted to bring in, but. Um, uh, we're hesitant about is the story of opium. If we move on to the next slide. Um, yes, opium um, is a, a quite a recent uh, acquisition by the Rijksmuseum. It's part of uh, two paintings done by Rembrandt of opium and her first husband. And um, they have been bought by the Rijksmuseum and the Louvre together. So they are, uh, as our last director called them, uh, the golden age at their goldest. Um, this is something that the museum is really proud about. So it was difficult to dive into the story of the connection to slavery, but there is a uh, striking connection here because Opian was married twice and both of her husbands um, have a connection to the sugar industry in Brazil. And her second husband, Martin Dai, even lived in Brazil before he married Opian. While he was living in Brazil, he um, uh, uh, took an enslaved woman into his home. Um, he had a forced uh, relationship with her for a while. And from that forced relationship, a child was born. And he was even um, brought to court because of that. Uh, and well, in that in those times, if you were brought to court for something like that, it must have been uh, pretty um, um, uh, violent what he did to her to um, make that happen. So these uh, all kinds of questions come to mind here. What did Opian know? Uh, what is her responsibility here? Uh, what is her agency? What could she have done if she knew? So these are all the kinds of questions that we want to raise in this exhibition. Um, and what we've been talking about is how art gains multiple meanings um, by using this uh, painting in this way. Um, and it allows us to talk also about uh, what experience do you see through art of that period and what remains invisible. Um, Let's move on to the next slide, and I've integrated a, a video in there, which allows us um, in this, uh, these uh, pandemic times to be able to relate with audiences that are not able to visit the exhibition and also talk about uh, this hidden history of uh, opium. Let's take a look at the video.
So as a curator, these um, things are always difficult to make. So because as you can see, it's only a few seconds. And in a few seconds, you are trying to convey so many things. Um, but we are so happy that we have all these techniques to be able to um, uh, relate to people. Um, and what we've done is this video was made with an audience in mind that is very new to the subject of slavery. Um, so we wanted to draw them in to be able to uh, show them um, the way we are working in the museum to connect different stories to our art and um, uh, to uh, um, we wanted also to um, uh, 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 speak to people about how to empathize with different parts of that story so it would not be uh, two parallel stories uh, anymore but that it would really integrate different perspectives within one story so if we move to the next slide, we were also, um, uh, yes, very much aware that if you speak about slavery, it's very important to not only speak about, um, um, uh, on the one hand, because that's how people uh, relate to it in the Netherlands, on the one hand, the people who felt the whip, and on the other hand, the people who were the slave owners. It is also really important to speak about resistance. Um, so it not, it's not just about um, what has been done to people, but also uh, you want to be able to speak about what, how people re reacted to their circumstances. And for the longest time, we thought that in our collections, we would not be able to find the object with which you could talk about this. But um, we were very happy to find this small print here of Toussaint Louverture, uh, the first black um, um, uh, uh, leader of state uh, in the Caribbean, in the French Caribbean, which also has a very distinctive connection to the Dutch history, because he was a big hero for um, enslaved people in Dutch Caribbean as well. Um, and he uh, inspired a, a rebellion in Curaçao. And this print allows us to uh, speak about that in the exhibition uh, as well. So of the 10 people you'll see in the exhibition, the first five uh, kind of explain how the system worked. But the second five are all people who are counter voices against the system all from different ethnic uh, backgrounds and from different parts of the world. So we are also able to um, um, see what the commonalities are, see what the difference are, differences are, and speak critically about how slavery came to an end. Was it something that was ended um, through those who were part of the system by, uh, through European hands? Or was it ended by the continuous uh, rebellions of people who were enslaved themselves, who changed the system from within? If we move to the next slide, we were also very much aware that um, historical objects, although those are the heart of our collection, historical objects uh, will not allow us to speak critically about the system itself. And it will not allow us to uh, show that perspective of uh, those who were enslaved. So we've also brought in modern art, in this case, this huge installation, La Bouche du Roi by Romuald Hazoumet uh, from Benin which is a reflection on historical objects, um, and the uh, drawing done of the slave ship, the Brooks, and it's an historical uh, reflection. It's a reflection on uh, an historical poem, uh, which connects it directly to Dutch history as well. But by reflecting on it from an African perspective, uh, Romewald um, uh, does a lot of things that we are not able to do um, uh, with historical object. It One of those things, it, it speaks to us from the perspective of those who were enslaved, but it also speaks to us uh, connecting the past and um, the present. Because this installation is also a reflection on what's happening in Benin nowadays, of people traveling with jerry cans, smuggling, um, 
uh, oil and uh, risking their lives in um, um, that trade. Um, and if we move to uh, the very last slide, yes. What we've done is, um, since we know that uh, um, new audiences will be coming into the museum to visit this exhibition, we wanted them to leave something behind. We wanted this to be something that they would not just see as consumers, but that they would be able to produce something as well. So that's why we brought in uh, Tirso Barta and David Bade, two art, uh, artists who will be working with our new visitors and um, our, our uh, visitors of the olden days as well, to construe 10 new statues, um, therefore making the um, persons who are central in our exhibition into uh, the new statues of the future um, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and that was what I wanted to speak to you about. So I would really like to thank you for um, your patience and your uh, attention. Uh, Thank you, Valika. This is a truly groundbreaking uh, exhibition that you are presenting to us. And I think um, bringing in the personal is a truly new way for us to start working as uh, museum uh, curators. And so we have much to discuss and much to look forward to. In March of 2020, despite the COVID-19 COVID -19 lockdown, lockdown uh, a network, a network of, major of major and small Dutch museums known as Museum Sea Color was launched to advance diversity and inclusion in the museum and heritage sector in a sustainable manner. It was just the beginning of a grassroots movement for cultural change in the Netherlands, which had, aim, had been simmering for years before global protests against ra racism erupted in June. The National Collaborative Program project Museum Sea Color coordinator Dr. Asfa Bainar is a Suriname Dutch sociologist and founder of the Education Studio. As an independent researcher, Asfa has written and developed various publications, exhibitions and teaching packages on the heritage and legacy of slavery in the Netherlands and the Dutch colonies. So I welcome Dr. Asfa Bainar. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm happy to share uh, this story with all of you. I would like to present to you a new and actual museum project running in the Netherlands at this moment. It is called Musea Bekennen Kleur, and in English you can say museums see color, literally meaning acknowledging color, but actually focusing on diversity and inclusion in the mutual sector, mutual sector. Museum Bekenne Kleur was initiated two years ago by four museums, the Central Museum, Bonavante Museum, Frans Hals Museum, and Van Abbe Museum. The direct cause for this was the announcement of the Rijksmuseum that they will present an exhibition on the Dutch history of slavery. And that was in 22-21. It is known for a long time that all the efforts made in the Netherlands during the last 30 years to improve diversity and inclusion hasn't been that successful so far. So the urge to do something about it is getting stronger. Let me share my screen with you. So after the procedure in which candidates uh, were invited to pick to pitch a plan of action, me and my teammate Sylvana Terlage were chosen to further conceptualize and develop this initiative. We started with these four museums, but within a short period of time, we found 13 museums to join Museum Bekenne Kleur. And this group consists of small and large museums located all over the Netherlands, as you can see on this slide. Now, the first step was to visit uh, these museums to interview the team. We wanted to find out more about their motives to join Musea Bekenne Kleur. We had long talks with the teams consisting of director, head of curators, head education, communication, and so on. 
We talked about their vision, goals, their efforts, problems and challenging they had been facing in realizing diversity and inclusion in the organization through the years. As a result of these talks, a few things came out. First, museums admit that there is a problem in the museum field with the representation of diversity. Second, most diversity projects are mainly visible to the public from the outside and hardly leading to structural changes within the organization itself. Third, the most challenging aspect for the organization is to recruit colleagues with diverse backgrounds. And fourth, the lack of an intermusual, intermusual platform to exchange knowledge about diversity issues and all issues that create discomfort. Fifth, an ardent wish to create such a platform. And sixth, the willingness to go that far to publish a statement sooner or later about how museums will work on diversity and inclusion. Now, what is the objective of Musea Bekenne Kleur. The objective of Musea Bekenne Kleur is to unite museums in a sustainable way in their aim to actually anchor diversity and inclusion in the DNA of the various organizations. We focus on the four elements, namely program, public, staff, and partners. And the basis to work this out is the diversity and inclusion code that was developed in the Netherlands last year as you can see here on the slide. Well, this code is a code of conduct of, for, and by for the Dutch cultural and creative sector. The code is an instrument of self-regulation, and the aim of the code is that the cultural and creative sector represents the broad diversity of Dutch society. A basic requirement is that the sector is equally accessible to everyone as a maker, producer, worker, and public. In this way, the sector becomes everyone's, and everyone's contributes in their own way. Everyone is appreciated for who he or she is, respected and heard and feels at home. There are five principles for the cultural and creative code to work out this code. They are, first, you know where you stand with regard to diversity and inclusion. Second, you integrate diversity and inclusion in your vision. And third, you create within your organization for compliance with the code. Fourth, you draw up an action plan aimed at continuous improvement. And fifth, you monitor and evaluate compliance with the code and you are accountable for it. Note that this is not a checklist. How you think and act inclusively in all activities on a daily basis determines the operation and strength of the code. The motto is apply and explain how. Think and act according to the code, reflect on it critically and be publicly accountable. The official launch of Musea Bekende Kleur was March 2020 during the opening of the exhibition um, Rembrandt's Black in the museum at Rembrandt House. An exhibition that caught worldwide attention for its shows underexposed work of art by Rembrandt and his contemporaries featuring black people in a new exhibition. And right after the successful launch, Museo Bekende Kleur had to face several challenges. COVID-19 breakthrough and locked down our society. George Floyd was killed and brought numbers of Dutch people to the street to demonstrate against racism, to join the Black Lives Matter movement. And museums were suffering loss of income because they had to close doors. But to our surprise, none of these critical issues had a negative effect on the development of Musea Bekende Kleur. Remarkably enough, Musea Bekende Kleur saw itself growing, also thanks to the awareness that the Black Lives Matter movement brought us. And within a short period of time, no fewer than 20 museums and archives subscribed for Musea Bekende Kleur. 
and still new museums are, and archives are seeking to participate. At this moment, Museum Bekende Kleur connects 33 museums and archives. For your information, the Netherlands has almost 680 museums. Luckily, and despite COVID-19, we were able to continue our activities for Musea Bekende Kleur, especially setting up the core activity of Musea Bekende Kleur, namely the reflection sessions. And I will come to that later on. But firstly, what are the advantages of the collaboration of Musea Bekende Kleur? Well, this is the first time in Dutch history that museums on this scale will collaborate in the field of diversity and inclusion. The cooperation of Musea Bekende Kleur is very strategic. First, it's the first time in Dutch history that museums have joined forces to, to formulate and implement joint policy. And second, because of the cooperation at board level and the establishment of a joint responsibility in the pursuit of an inclusive museum sector. Third, because of the long-term nature of the collaboration in which the awareness process is central and not the output. Fourth, because of the structural exchange of knowledge about inclusion between museums. And fifth, because of the regional spread of partnerships. Sixth, because of the participation of visual art museums as well as city and historical museums. Seventh, because they join forces to present a public and educational program. So to strengthen the mutual partnership and cooperation, Museum Bekende Kleur is developing the following projects. It is an intermusial platform for reflection, but as output a statement, but also an educational program for children for 10 to 12 years. As you can see here on the slide. An international symposium, which will be developed in 2022, and also project exhibitions from the participating museums are presented uh, to the public, highlighting the themes of slavery, colonial history, or cultural diversities. And these exhibitions form the flywheel of Musea Bekende Kleur. And we have, of course, a website, and you can find us at LinkedIn and Instagram. Now, what is the structure and the content of Musea Bekende Kleur? Well, the central part of Musea Bekende Kleur is the use of reflection sessions. And through these sessions, we research, discuss discomfortable and sensitive issues in order to bring our thoughts together within the participating museums. And note that these sessions are the heart of Musea Bekende Kleur. The reflection sessions are conducted under the guidance of a professional supervisor. A point of departure is a safe setting to have these conversations together in which the following core values form the basis. Vulnerability, self-criticism and curiosity. To have these core values embedded, we organize a ritual meet and dialogue beforehand called the Kitty Kotti Dialogue Table. The Kitty Kotti Dialogue Table is an invented tradition introduced by Mercedes Sandwijken. And like me, she is from Surinamese background and Kitty Kotti refers to the Dutch history of slavery and literally means breaking the chains. And these dialogue tables are now becoming increasingly popular both nationally and internationally. And the table is used as the first session to get acquainted and to come close together. The Kitty Kotti dialogue table, originating from Jewish and Surinamese tradition, aims to increase awareness of the inner and social conflict and blind spots that arise from the complex historical and social backgrounds of the Dutch slavery and the colonial past in order to obtain new insights. We have gone through seven sessions in which we ask ourselves, what does diversity mean for me? What does it mean for the organization? What is my role in the organization when it comes to diversity and inclusion? What are the non-written cultural symbolic symbols 
heroic attributes, patterns, norms, and values of our organization? How does the organization cope with institutional racism, discrimination, and exclusion? And what is the perspective from which we create and develop our programs? How can we recruit new colleagues concerning diversity? What can we learn from the outlooks of our website and the architecture of our museum concerning diversity? And so on and so on. We were lucky to have three uh, sessions physically, face to face. And the other five sessions took place online because of COVID-19. No need to say how challenging that was for reflecting in passport photo format kills many of the eye contact, facial mind, body language, and so on. Nevertheless, it became clear that everyone took their participation bloody serious. They were enthusiastic and engaged. We had sessions every three weeks and each session lasted three and a half hours. The participants were given assignments to be carried out within the organization. Important to note is that the participants no longer want to talk about the order concerning diversity, but with the order in our reflection sessions. So therefore we had created an expertise group, Musea Bekende Kleur. And this group has been set up especially for Musea Bekende Kleur, bringing together different perspectives, new knowledge and insights. And these new insights will be tested and explored for the purpose of our statement. Now, what is the output of these reflection sessions? The results of where we stand after going through these sessions is expressed in a statement. And that statement is in process at this very moment, a statement that will lead to joint effort for substantive policy change, make agreements about this and ensure that agreements are complied with. And after that, the participating museums will continue the partnership in order to keep working on the above mentioned condition in the coming years, in order to realize that we no longer need to be afraid of being vulnerable, self-critical and curious. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Asfa. Uh, you shared some uh, wonderful and inspiring examples of what we can achieve together. And I really look forward to seeing what Museum Sea Color does in the next few years and uh, what all of us can contribute to these very, very important issues. Um, now I'd like to welcome uh, our other uh, speakers back to the screen and uh, we'll uh, have a little conversation and um, I'll ask a few questions and uh, sum things up uh, before we end, the, we end the, the sessions. So everybody is uh, back on screen. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, a really inspiring um, talks that have uh, enriched my thinking and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have some uh, interesting things to follow up on. I'm just going to go in order of, of your presentations. I'll have a question for each of you and then uh, we can, if you have something for me, I'm, I'm happy to, um, to, to talk about what's going on at the National Gallery as well. Um, Carwan, uh, you brought to light um, complexities and contradictions and paradox with regard, with regard to um, the Dutch colonial enterprise. Um, and um, a lot of it uh, is very new to me. Um, I don't know that a lot of this has actually kind of worked its way into, you know, the art historical world and the curatorial world, I think probably more so uh, in the Netherlands than it has um, here. So this is all uh, very, very important and very interesting um, work. Can you tell me a bit about your research methodologies into the history of the Dutch engagement with slavery, what we know now, as opposed to maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago? And I'm thinking back when I was in grad school, when I was uh, thinking about that question. And um, I ask you this because um, there's a long history of art historians considering and taking into consideration uh, patronage. However, you know, we were often just kind of satisfied. We'd look at the portrait, we'd identify 
sitters. We, if we're lucky, we could identify a sitter. And, you know, so they were, you know, um, they were emerged in the merchant class. They were invested in the Dutch East or West India Company. Um, and then it would kind of stop there. They were involved in trade. And I just wonder if um, there, and there was no consideration of what that actually meant in real terms, in, in particularly in the cost of lives. So I just wonder how that kind of knowledge, the, the work that you've done as a historian, has brought to light what that really means, and if you can kind of just fill that out a, a little bit for us. Yes, well, um, there have been, um, there has always been attention, of course, to the history of the Dutch uh, Empire um, and how that reflected on the Netherlands, but um, especially that that interaction um, between uh, the world overseas and the Netherlands itself, I think that is uh, that is quite new. So for a long time, it was something that companies did overseas, and there was very little considerations of what that meant in the Netherlands itself. Um, and new research, um, and I've been also been been part of that, is uh, has been uh, considering the economic impact of the of the overseas empire uh, in, in the Netherlands, which is a very maybe typically Dutch question to ask, you know, how much how much money did we get? Um, but from that, uh, also other questions are being considered, for example, about the self-fashioning of elites as uh, part of, of the empire. Uh, beautiful research by uh, Brumho and Van Gant on um, uh, the, the family of Orange and how the, the family of Orange presented itself um, in the world and how they relied on their empire for their diplomacy and for their... Um, um, well, a cultural uh, presentation. So that is, uh, that is, I think, um, yeah, really informing us uh, of what has been, been going on and very valuable um, and something that has also been studied earlier, but, but really has, 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 has gained more speed um, is to, to, to reconstruct the histories of people of African descent in, in the Low Countries and in the Netherlands. Um, uh, beyond uh, the, the slave master relationship, you see the development very early on of a, of a, of a um, um, uh, uh, African descendant uh, community in, in cities like like Amsterdam. So those, uh, yeah, those I think are, are elements um, all looking at what did being a center of a colonial empire mean for for the Netherlands locally. Yeah, and I think the um, kind of that kind of links into some things I, I, I wanted to talk to uh, Valika about, um, you know, getting to know those histories of the the minor characters in, in many portraits or the, you know, if we do see uh, black people in paintings, which um, isn't as common as uh, as we would like it to be in order to you know, kind of make our exhibitions more representative. And there was that important exhibition at the Rembrandt House uh, very recently that kind of addressed this issue. And I'm, um, uh, and I, so that kind of leads in, uh, it, it, it's wonderful to hear that, you know, we're learning more about those histories um, through different methods of, of research, I assume as well. Um, but, and it, it's, um, I just talk maybe Valika talk a little bit about. I mean, you at the Rijksmuseum, you have a kind of um, unusual situation um, in that you're a history museum and an art museum, and it kind of I think that gives you a a different perspective, access to different kinds of of knowledge than say a strictly you know we're a strictly an, an art museum in a very traditional sense, and it doesn't and it it, it also brings in the hierarchy of high art and and material culture. Um, so I think the Rijks Museum is kind of a, a wonderful setting to start this kind of more complex um, uh, um, storytelling. Um, but so just maybe talk a little bit about how you kind of bridge that gap and tell those stories of things that from uh, you know, the traditional art historian's perspective are often not visible. You know, you can talk about patronage, but you only just see that they're wearing a wealthy out, you know, a very expensive outfit. That's the limit of what's what's visible. And we face that a little bit with the Rembrandt exhibition where we really wanted to talk about some of these issues. But because that hadn't been in our minds when we began five years ago, the selection of works, there was nothing, there was very, very little to kind of you know, make it a visible part of the exhibition. Anyway, so just talk a little bit about those complexities and, and issues. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the question. 
um, what's really helped us is, um, on the one hand, what you said, we have two uh, different kinds of departments, the Department of Art, and then we have the Department of History. But also, uh, a few years ago, the museum decided that it wanted to focus on personal stories. It wanted to be relatable to our visitors, and um, you accomplish that by bringing stories that uh, people can imagine themselves in, and, and, and uh, representation is also so a goal in uh, what we are doing. So when we started out this um, project of um, organizing the slavery exhibition, from the start, it was uh, clear that we wanted to focus on personal stories. And um, um, the museum knew that the uh, curators that have been part of the museum for a long time, they have a great deal of knowledge, but that the bulk of knowledge around uh, slavery uh, history has not been built up in the museum itself. So we needed to bring down our walls and to bring in new people that look at it from a, a different way. Now, I was one of the people that was brought in and um, I said from the start, it's really important not to focus just on the objects that you already have, but you have to think from the narrative on. What do I want to uh, be able to talk about? And then you find the objects and the archival records and uh, whatever else you need to be able to um, bring that story across. So that's how we came on, uh, came up with the whole, um, um, we have to bring in oral history as well. That was completely new to the museum. But it has worked out really well to bring all those different types of knowledge together because it, it really makes you pose new questions to what you already know. So all of us who have worked on this, and, and Karwan and, and Asfa can speak about this too, we have all been pushed to question what we thought we knew. Yeah. Um, and and once you do that, you see that it's really a community effort. So I'm so proud that what you see in the exhibition is something that not one group had uh, could have done by itself. And for the museum, it's really a, a new face and accomplishment that we are able to bring in so many people with different uh, professional backgrounds, with different personal backgrounds that help us relate to our collection in new ways, uh, help us discover new stories in our own collection, and really help us democratize the museum. So it... Um, uh, much more people will be able to recognize themselves and their ancestors in here. Um, and much more people will find it uh, easier to approach the museum to be part of what's produced in the museum. That's why that last art, ex uh, um, art exhibition where people, visitors can contribute um, their own ideas to the exhibition. That's why it's so important. So it's, it's really a lot of hands that built this uh, exhibition and it's the way forward for the museum in exhibitions to come. You really think that, yeah, the, obviously you have a whole process set in place and kind of those, the taking that approach of the personal history. And I, and I think also um, the personal experiences of the different people that are involved in in uh, building the exhibition. That's kind of a new way of working, you know, as opposed to kind of, you know, how uh, when when I was trained, you know, I was very rarely, you know, if you used I in your essay, I think, you know, that that wasn't allowed. And that it's a really, it's a really, sh it's a, it's a quite a shift in how we're, how we're, how we're thinking. And, um, and of course here in Canada, we're, we're dealing with, uh, other issues as well in terms of colonialism and the indigenous populations and rights to land and uh, appropriation of land and also traditional ways of knowledge. And um, and that also brings in different ways of seeing and and that I think is is all for for the good and, and, and quite, quite exciting. And, you know, I think we have a map in the um, the Rembrandt exhibition, which shows, of course, the traditional thing of all the trading routes, uh, you know, of the Dutch and East West India Company. But it also shows a small portion of what existed in North America, especially where the Dutch first arrived in 1613 of what already existed and of, of trading routes, which were 
uh, perhaps less exploitative than, than the trading routes that are represented by the Dutch uh, kind of little trajectories across the ocean, but they're vast, right? And they had a whole social, so just kind of bringing a balance back. And also I think, um, and the personal, the uh, one of the, um, uh, we, we brought in an art historian of indigenous culture to kind of speak about uh, some of the works and it, it kind of bringing to fore, you know, a, a very different tone, speaking about what um, interested him and, um, and his own personal experience uh, um, with relation to landscape as opposed to uh, um, uh, Dutch traditions and indigenous traditions. So it's, it's all, it's very, very rich and, and fruitful. Um, so, uh, uh, Asfa, um, I really like the idea of, of your museum sees color working jointly together. Um, that's, I mean, that's kind of the, the, the bigger story about, I mean, all three of you worked, uh, um, on the, uh, slavery exhibition, even though all three of you don't work at, at the Rijks Museum. Um, and so just maybe, can you speak a little bit to that, like the, um, the advantages of doing that, as opposed to say um, um, a big institution like the National Gallery or the Rijks Museum, making internal efforts to change the way they work and in, and and work on inclusion and equity and diversity, but this kind of this very cross institutional approach, which sounds quite hard in many ways, but I wonder if there's kind of advantages. Um, behind it that that kind of make the enterprise actually maybe a little more um, doable? Uh, thanks for the question, um, Erika. Uh, yes, like you see, uh, Bisher Bekenekleur is there because they all want to have diversity and inclusion more and deeply and better embedded in the organization for a sustainable way, in a sustainable way. And they all feel uh, the motivation very strong and the, uh, the urgency to do something about it at this moment. Uh, so we encompass large museums and smaller museums. And uh, I think that what I can say at the moment is that the smaller museum seems to be more able to work on diversity because uh, they lack of hierarchy. And for bigger museums, that is uh, quite an issue. Uh, but nevertheless, we find each other in discussing it in this huge platform. And our um, way of doing that is through the reflection sessions. And in the reflection sessions, uh, the bigger museums and the smaller museums find each other in discussing what does diversity mean, especially for the Rijksmuseum, yeah. who's there in the big city. But what does it mean for another small museum farther away in the Netherlands, not um, not in a big city, for instance. But we also discuss very much uh, what makes it uneasy for us to work on diversity, because it is also it has something to do with racism, a lot of to do with racism. It has to do with how it is institutionalized in the museum. It also has to do with uh, things like we know call white privilege and also uh, the uneasiness of tokenism. Yeah. Um, uh, having people of color apply for a job and then put them on the issue of, uh, yeah. of diversity to work that out for the whole organization. So we discuss also that, those things, but also uh, what are the words that we use to express ourselves on the websites? Uh, what are the words that we use to express ourselves in uh, jobs positioning when we are looking for new uh, people to work with us? Uh, but also the building, what does the building say? What does it mean for several groups? And um, uh, so I think um, these are good uh, conversations, very important conversations. And uh, with all these uh, museums uh, all together, uh, I think my wish with Museum Bekende Kleur is that we all feel that this discussion needs to be continued. Yeah. There is not an end at this discussion yet. We need to discuss it and keep each other sh uh, sharp, evaluate each other, be critical for each other. And like I told you, we have these three values within uh, Museum Bekende Kleur, and that is uh, vulnerability, self-criticism, and um, eagerness. Yes, and I think uh, the code of ethics is is a is a very important part, and it's also something that can be shared, right, to get the conversation going 
globally uh, mm -hmm. as well, because um, um, it's um, sometimes very hard to get those those conver conversations started. And I wondered also, in a way, um, the exercise, the the exhibition, uh, slavery at the Rijksmuseum, and I was just thinking a little bit, you mentioned uh, Valika about transparency and, and maybe we could talk a little bit about how you achieved that because I'm thinking in, in the context of changing the way we work to continue this conversation so it doesn't just become an exercise of you know a certain department of of the museum or you know a certain um, parts of the 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 population within a museum or outside to kind of keep those issues going. In fact, you worked in a cross-departmental collaborative fashion. You worked with people outside. And we, as we mentioned before, you had this quite different approach of taking on the personal, that that, in fact, is laying the groundwork for the conversation to continue. And it's kind of, you've, if you change the way you work, you know, it's not something, it's not, oh, it's not imposed, it's not a, a structure imposed from the outside, if you see what I'm saying. So I wonder if we might talk a little bit about what changed in, in, in how things worked at the Rijksmuseum and, and that on particularly around transparency. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I think what you might be able to say, it's not um, uh, opposed uh, from the outside, but I do think that change comes from the outside. And I think that the Rijksmuseum was ready for change. So uh, that coming together, that really helped. So once the Rijksmuseum started inviting people in, uh, those people invited other people to cooperate with. Um, so the, it, it was a network um, approach. Uh, the, the network grew larger and larger. I was very aware that if you want people to work with us, we, we had to prove to them that we were serious about change, serious about uh, what they were able to do. Um, an, an important part, uh, for example, was that the members of the think tank, if they were um, uh, freelancers, that we would pay them. In the past, that was not uh, done as, uh, um, as well. Um, so you really value people for what they bring in and you don't just take their work and make it your own and then tell the world what the Rex Museum has done. Mm -hmm. So in the whole media um, uh, campaign that's now going on, we explicitly bring to the fore the people that worked with us and we let them speak about it in the media. So. I, I think in the media, it's really clear that we could not have done this by ourselves and that we did not want to do this by ourselves. Um, so, yeah, I think that's really important. And I think it set the bar really high for our next exhibition, which is also about a colonial topic, Indonesia and the revolution going on there. And there, of course, there's different groups. Again, uh, it's not exactly the same groups as that been working on slavery so it'll be a new process and a new getting to know each other and getting to know what uh, the sensibilities are um, or, um, and, and I'm looking forward to that I mean it's a great adventure and I'm sure that sometimes we'll fall down and we'll do the wrong thing and I'm hoping that we'll be able to learn from that again and uh, um, yeah, stand on the shoulders of the one who went of the ones who went before us. Yes, uh, so I think it's um, you know um, very um, lo very much uh, looking forward, and yes, making mistakes as we go and um, and learning from them, and kind of being more open open to that. Uh, and I think groups like Museum Seed Color create um, a place or create a space for uh, you know uh, dealing with those those vulnerable uh, issues. Um, I'm just wondering about. Um, um, in terms of, um, you know, the public discourse around around these issues that there's sometimes, I mean, a fair amount of resistance from some quarters, um, you know, challenging those old national histories that a lot of people took pride in. But I also want to challenges as well, and, um, and I, th I certainly sense them here, both internally in the museum and externally, of not doing enough. Um, so I just wonder where where do you see the overall mood, or or is it um, 
And I think, you know, and I think I'm, we're here very much closer to the States where I think there's much more of a binary opposition and kind of all the issues around culture. And I just wonder what, just give a sense of the mood in, 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 in the Netherlands and, and what your hopes for, for the future are and how you as an academic are playing a role in that, in that kind of broader public discussion. Well, it was. Um, it, it, it has been so so interesting to be part of this uh, uh, the, the production of this specific exhibition on slavery in the Rijks Museum, but also other exhibitions on similar issues uh, and how they confronted uh, this. And I, I think their the museums are really setting new uh, standards uh, and also becoming themselves uh, institutions that produce knowledge very actively and seek to produce it. Um, uh, the Maurice House has, has done something similar with, with fellowships because they simply thought that, that what we were doing in the university was lacking and they needed more um, uh, research that was also historical in nature. And well, I think the things that Palika said and, and, and Asfa as well about how do we address uh, there were some of the problems in, in, in society that are also part of the museums that are definitely part of the um, the universities as well. I think it's very inspiring what the, uh, what the museums are doing. Um, um, in the universities, we're too much looking at sort of delegating things to specific offices rather than, than making it part of our own uh, uh, project. Um, when, when we talk about the politicization, the, uh, 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 the polarization and politicization around these issues, I think in, in the Netherlands, in a way, we're a bit uh, blessed that, that our, our political system is very fragmented. Mm. Uh, um, so there is no binary. Um, right. There is not, not a very clear political binary, which, which creates the kind of space to have um, uh, nuance and, 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 and sort of uh, more open, uh, open discussions, maybe. Um, but I do see that, that there is this tendency to import this, this binary uh, language also to, uh, to the Netherlands. So I think that is a, that is a very clear danger uh, mm -hmm. to, um, because it's a very easy way, of course, to, uh, to, to, to talk about these issues. And it's also one in which everybody can have an opinion and everybody can participate. So yeah, <laughs> that is, um, um, there is a danger of, of sliding towards that kind of uh, binary, uh, binary discussion. Um, but on the whole, I think what we see in the Netherlands is that um, the, the, the Netherlands was, was the heart of a globe-spanning globe empire and had been for, for hundreds of years, far into the 20th century. And there was uh, a consciousness uh, as also after the Second World War, maybe especially after the Second World War, uh, that the social peace of the empire needed to be preserved. Um, and that, um, that it's part of the history of, of the, 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 well, quite um, serious war that went on in Indonesia, but also the, the, the traumatic decolonization uh, in, uh, uh, in the Atlantic world, um, or for, from a Dutch perspective, uh, traumatic in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that coming to terms with that was very difficult for an older uh, generation, and there is a generation, I think, now um, older than me, but not yet retired. Let's let's put it there. Yeah. Uh, who 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 are mar who have become much more open to addressing this history of the empire, um, and who have been willing to sort of open that that door and to to let in that that uh, the, the the kind of voices that were kept out for such a long time. And I think that is um, that is um, uh, an, an interesting dynamic because a lot of the, the kind of criticism of the colonial project and of colonial hierarchies and of racism, those have been in, around since forever, um, but they have not been able to reach the kind of mainstream. And I, I, there, there seems to be this openness in this older generation to say, well, it's, we don't have an empire to lose if we if we open that door and and that has I think created some space to have these conversations more more candidly and and to invest in research projects into the, the colonial wars into the history of slavery um, and I'm not saying that it's all, 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 all easy and especially questions around racialization and national mm -hmm. identity are yeah. really very sensitive yeah um, but uh, things have, have clearly changed in, in the last uh, last few uh, few years. Yeah, and it, it sounds like the next project at the Rijks Museum, if it's on Indonesia, that's a good stepping stone to continue those those conversations and uh, uh, into 
uh, the, the later 19th and, and 20th century. So I think we're going to wrap up here. It's been a long evening. I know uh, it's quite late uh, in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, so really, really thank you very much. This is going to be um, a wonderful resource for, for our visitors, where many of whom are just, you know, dealing with these. This is the first time they're kind of addressing these issues, partic particularly within the walls of, of the, the National Gallery of Canada. So I really want to, to thank you very much. And I hope we have occasion to to cross paths again. I think this, um, you know, working in new ways is is very inspiring and, and, and I'm quite, quite excited. Um, you've all uh, enriched my knowledge and nuanced my thinking um, about uh, the issues of uh, slavery and, and the history of attitudes towards it, the way we can work and change exhibitions and do exhibitions in new ways and, and join together to, to create a more diverse and equitable uh, place to live and work in. So um, I thank you very, very much. And um, I look forward to seeing you soon. And I have doubt very much I'll be able to see the slavery exhibition. I don't think um, travel is going to happen soon. And I don't think you'll be able to get here to, oh, to see this one, but uh, maybe uh, Balika. Well, if I can just um, uh, um, um, add, if you follow us on Instagram, you yeah. will find animations there. And on uh, our website, you'll be able to do short video tours, which will allow you to see bits of the slavery exhibition. Wonderful. And also our exhibition, uh, it was co-produced or co-organized with the Städel in Frankfurt. So it will go there. So uh, of course, they're not going to have the, 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 the kind of the, the part that we brought in um, talking about uh, um, the issues, uh, um, uh, talking about how the Dutch arriving in North America, we, that was kind of an element that we brought in here. So that won't go to, to the Städel, but um, you can see uh, the rest of the exhibition exhibition there. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to say good night. I'm going to say a few concluding words for, for our audience. Um, uh, but thank you. Um, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so please check out the gallery's uh, website for other events and talks for the Rembrandt in Amsterdam exhibition. And you can learn more about Rembrandt and his contemporaries by checking out the online digitorial uh, that was a production, a co-production between the Stadel Museum in Frankfurt, Germany and the National Gallery of Canada. So from Amsterdam and from Ottawa, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>